Okay, so uh, black box testings uh, we had just uh, initiated. So we can start off. So testing in the large versus testing in the small, isn't it? So what does it mean? Uh, whenever we are testing a software product, so generally the testing is done at the unit level or you can say at the individual component level. So this is referred to as testing in a unit wise or in the small scale, okay? So when all the components or modules are individually tested, then the components are slowly integrated and suppose there are five components so when one component is integrated with the second again testing is performed then once that is done again it is integrated with third and then again testing was performed so the components are slowly added up and then the testing is carried out at each level of integration okay so this sometimes you also call as integration testing then finally when all the integration of all the units has been done then we test the entire system as a whole okay so integration and System testing are known as testing to which is done in a large scale. Now, when we talk about uh, unit testing, so unit testing basically is done uh, when a module suppose has been or a unit or a part of the system has been coded, it has been implemented and it has been reviewed. Okay, so unit testing, uh, sometimes also called as uh, module testing, is basically what do we do is we test different units or modules of a particular project or a software but in isolation okay they don't have any kind of dependencies the units are not dependent on one another they are tested on a isolation okay so in order uh, uh, to do this kind of uh, testing of single modules what we need to do is we need to build up a complete environment where uh, such kind of testing is carried out okay the modules are being tested on an individual level okay so whenever we are going to test the module uh, these are certain steps that we need to follow the procedures uh, belonging to other modules that the module under test calls okay so um, these things are also should be taken care suppose if we have a procedure in one module which calls another module okay so that part that procedure also needs to be tested then uh, uh, we need to also check uh, the the data structures which are not local that means which are global or maybe static in nature okay that the particular module accesses okay then a procedure or a function okay or a method subroutine which calls uh, functions of the module and the test so all these things needs to be taken care so uh, modules are required to pro uh, provide the necessary environment uh, is usually not available until they too have been unit tested. Tubs and drivers are designed to provide the complete environment for a module. So let us see uh, diagrammatically. <laughs> you have something like this. So whenever we are making the testing. So first of all, we need to uh, like load, okay, suppose if we have a kind of a global data, then we need to bring it under here and under the unit testing, all other, uh, the data structures which has been used, the variables, local variables, okay, functions, okay, which has been used for that module will be loaded here. And if suppose we have any global variable or global data that needs to be traced, then that has to be loaded from the driver module. Okay, and then corresponding to that, whenever the modules are uh, being required to be tested then what we need to do uh, we need to check uh, whether uh, those modules are available or not and accordingly an environment has to be created for every module to be tested so whenever an environment is created what are the things we need we need the testing module we need the stuffs and drivers so uh, a stuff is basically what it is a kind of a method a dummy method that has uh, similar input output parameters as the given procedure but has a for example a stop procedure may produce the user using a simple table lookup mechanism a driver okay 
you remember and would also have the code to call the different one with the okay fine in this figure if you see uh, what do we have we have suppose uh, the modules that we need to test okay so that is being loaded here but if we have suppose global data okay or suppose the data which is referencing to some other modules then through the driver module that has to be brought in okay now if suppose any kind of um, input output operations are being performed okay or so this module is performing then similar kind of information what it is doing that has to be preserved in the top module okay so that was something uh, about little bit about uh, unit testing then when we talk about uh, in unit testing uh, or maybe where while we perform uh, testing there are certain again testing strategies that we need to follow one is the black box testing or maybe white box testing so in black box testing, basically what happens, the test cases, okay, that means you have the various cases, what kind of response you should get based on a certain input, isn't it? All those test cases is being designed, okay, from an examination of the input output values only, and there is no knowledge of the design or the coding takes place. So you have a system or you have a module of a system, so you are only uh, knowing the the input data that is being uh, one should apply to the uh, system okay and what kind of output is expected but you don't know how the system is being built what kind of coding mechanisms or algorithm has been used okay how it is designed those things are uh, kept hidden so that's the reason it's called black box inside you are not knowing what is happening okay so whenever one is making or going for black box testing then there are two main approaches for um, having a uh, black box testing one is equivalence uh, class partitioning and uh, uh, the other one is boundary value analysis okay main approaches are there the first approach is equivalence uh, class partitioning in this uh, approach uh, the domain that means the all set of input values okay that should, can be given to uh, the particular project, software, whatever you can say, system sir. is divided. Yes. So you then from my side that uh, uh, what time uh, performing black box testing. So two approaches are there: equivalence class the partition partitioning. This should be partitioning. Okay. And boundary value analysis okay so in equivalence uh, class partitioning in this kind of approach what happens is uh, all the possible input values that basically we can give to a program is partition or you can say it's classified into a set of equivalence classes okay so each of the classes will be having certain set of input values this partitioning is done such that the behavior of the program is examined and for every uh, input data okay from belonging to the equivalence classes okay they will behave in a same way okay the main idea behind doing this okay uh, like generating the equivalence classes is that testing the code with uh, any one value belonging to the equivalence class is as good as testing the software with any other value belonging to that equivalence class so what is this trying to say is whatever the input value of different data are there okay their response to the code to the system will be generating more or less the same kind of response or output okay so ex equivalent classes for a software can be designed by examining the input data and output data okay so whenever we are uh, making or designing the equivalence classes what are the various things that we need to keep in mind so if the input data uh, values to a system can be given okay suppose we can tell like the range of values that uh, the input data can have okay then one value uh, then in that case what can we do we can construct the valid equivalent classes similarly we can co construct certain equivalence classes where the data inputs if given to the system the the system will not be given as the as the output as expected so that will be taken to be as in invalid equivalence classes okay now if suppose the input data assumes uh, values from a set of discrete members of some domain 
then one equivalence class for valid input values and another equivalence should be defined. So, so what is it trying to say is that if the input data uh, takes, uh, let's say, not a continuous value, but random values, discrete values, isn't it? Okay, then in that class, in th that case, what happens? We need to uh, construct uh, one equivalence class where uh, the input values will be the valid ones. That means, given the input value, the system should be giving us the output as expected and another class of input data where if suppose this input data is being supplied to the system then we will be getting uh, invalid output okay uh, given like this is an equivalence class uh, three equivalence classes they have constructed. Suppose, for example, we have a software that calculates the square root of an input integer, which can assume values in the range of zero up till positive 5,000. There are three equivalence classes, the set of negative integers, the set of integers in the range of zero to 5,000, and the integers larger than 5,000. Therefore, the test cases must include representatives for each of the three equivalence classes and a possible test case, case can be this. So for example, in this case, suppose we have a system which will calculate the square root, okay? So we have to construct three different equivalence classes according to this condition. So one equivalence class will basically represent the set of negative integers, okay? So we can take one discrete value, maybe let's say minus five is that, which represents this set of negative integers. Another one may be set of integers ranging from 0 to 5,000. So maybe I can have an equivalence class, let's say, of 500. And another, an integer which has larger than 5,000. So maybe we can have 6,000. Okay, so this way, based on the conditions, we can write down the equivalence classes. Here, there were three conditions, hence three equivalence classes were generated. Then... Um, Another one we have, uh, designing a black box test suit, okay? So the uh, program, basically, uh, this program, like our system that we are developing, finds the intersection of two straight lines, okay, and displays the result. So it reads two integer pairs, let's say, for example, M1C1 and M2C2, okay? And uh, what is M? M is, what is M1, M2? You must be acquainted with this uh, uh, straight line equation, Y is equal to MX plus C. Have anyone encountered this uh, uh, equation before? The equation of a straight line? Yes. 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 What is what is M basically? Slope. First slope. Very good. And what about C? It's constant. Constant. Yes. Very good. It's a constant. Okay. So suppose, for example, we have these two integer pairs. We need to check whether they are satisfying the conditions as given by uh, this uh, straight line equation. So M1, C1 may be a slope and may be a constant on one particular straight line. M2 and C2, may, uh, M2 and C2 again may be a slope and a constant for uh, another second straight line, okay? Because two straight lines are being defined, isn't it, using this equation. Now, uh, as per the straight line uh, concept, okay, so if we are devising that we need to show that this line, uh, this straight line, M1, C1, who's having slope M1 and constant C1, and this one, okay, they are equivalent to one another. So if we are uh, form formulating that concept, then what we need to check is we need to satisfy certain conditions as per that straight family of straight lines they're having, right? Like, for example, if the lines are parallel, then in that case, the slopes of the two straight lines should be equal and the constants should not be equal. If they are intersecting lines, then the slope of the two straight lines should not be same. If they are coincident lines, then in that case, the slope also should be equal and the constants also or the intercepts also should be equal. Okay, so if suppose these conditions are being satisfied, any one of them, then we can say that the uh, this equation, uh, sorry, not this equation, these two straight lines belong to the equivalent set of classes. Basically, it will depend on the value, basically, what is M1 value, what is M2's value, what is C1's value, what is C2 value, isn't it? Okay, so depending upon that, basically, we can come to a conclusion that whether they represent the equivalent classes of relations. 
ओके ओके देन टुडे आई विल स्टॉप